So we will have a couple of seconds or minutes up front of this. Shouldn't be the problem. So yeah, cool. Look, this looks. Yeah. So let's give this a couple of. So the stream is working. Um, so we do have roughly seven people watching already. So if you join us already, hi, hi. great you are here. Let's let's give it a couple of minutes. Uh, Dimitri, how are you? Hi. How are you? Yeah, now to talk to me. Hi. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see you. It's all good. So you might hear my cat who thinks she didn't get enough. So sorry for that. Um, she's rather insistent on complaining about the amount of food she gets. So, uh, yeah, so we're approaching like seven-ish. Um, let me say hi in the channel. I will cut most of this out. Um, Tighten more. Really. Are you yourself familiar with HTTP4K? Not yet, to be honest. So this is one of the reasons why I was really looking forward to this talk. Um, it's always nice to see mm. some new frameworks. So I learned about Fritz too, which is a uh, Kotlin first, a Kotlin, a pure Kotlin front end uh, framework, which was rather amazing. Oh, I heard of that. Um, a really, really nice one. So if you want to watch it, and if you want to watch it, um, feel free to look through the history on the channel. Okay. Can highly recommend it. Uh, it's a really, really young project, but they really rock. So it's, they, it looked really promising. So I have to play around with it as well. And I'm actually really looking into, uh, looking forward to hear more about HTTP 4K. And um, right, so let's make a cut on here. Hi, folks. It is uh, 7 p.m. at least here in Germany. <laughs> And uh, it's the last Thursday in month uh, of the month. I can't even talk anymore. Uh, we all know what this means. It means we are here to have another amazing live session for our virtual Kotlin user group. With me today is Dimitri. Hi, Dimitri. How are you doing? Hi. Yeah, I'm good. Perfect. So um, I won't say so uh, too much. I just want to mention that if you like it, hit the like button and the subscribe button uh, down somewhere in this corner, I think. And also a reminder, we are always looking for offers for this year's Java Advent. I will put a link into the description later. Uh, so don't be shy, contact us. So Dimitri, also to you, if you want to have an, uh, an article out over Christmas as a little Christmas gift, uh, well, early Christmas gift, give me a shout. I will shut up now. I will hand it over to you. I'm really looking forward to the session and to all of us, enjoy. Oh, thank you. So I guess, as you can see from the screen now, this talks about server as a function with HTTP4K. And there are like a few things to explain. And the first thing in the title is server as a function. So if you're not familiar with this, this whole idea comes that this was popularized in this paper, your server as a function was like published by Marius when I, and it, the whole, paper is based basically on other like work which was done as Twitter. And in particular, Finagle, which is an RPC system for JVM. It's like written in Scala. It's not necessarily HTTP, it works for other protocols as well. And here is a GitHub for Finagle. So it's, as you can see, it's open source. You can take a look at this. And based on a similar idea, there is a, a toolkit 
for writing HTTP applications in Kotlin, and that's HTTP4K. So that's the HTTP4K uh, website. And it's based on similar ideas, but not exactly the same. I'll show the difference a bit later. And similar to this, HTTP4K is also Apache 2 open source. You can find source code in GitHub. And it was written by Dave Denton and Ivan Sanchez. So you can see it started around 2017 and still ongoing. It's similar to Finagle. It's not a pet project. It's been used on like real big projects. For, so yeah, it's, it's not a hobby project at all. So it's all production quality. So I'm not going to show like many more slides and I'll try to explain the differences like, in the code. So to kind of demonstrate, then I'll use this problem of implementing a simple tic-tac-toe board. So the idea is to have something like a physical board, but in a web page. It's not very interactive. It's kind of single page you can play on one computer, maybe with another person. So don't expect anything too complex. And the whole architecture will be something like that. There is a browser. So there will be two components, front end and back end, both in Kotlin. And browser can get do a get request to front end. Then front end forwards it to back end. Back end does something and sends back JSON. And front end renders it and sends it back to the browser. So that's the overall idea. And I'll use IntelliJ for this Kotlin. And that's pretty much like the whole intro. So I'll just start typing. So here I have IntelliJ, as you can guess. So I have a main function. Uh, just checking that it works. And the main concept with server as a function HTTP4K is HTTP handler. So HTTP handler is a type LS which takes a request and returns a response. So if we want to say like write hello world, we can do something like that. Uh, let's say hello world. So what's going on here is that we have a variable of type HTTP handler. If I jump to the source code, this is a type LS from immutable request to immutable response. I assume that you're familiar with Kotlin, so I'm not going to go deeper into the concept. So that's literally just a Lambda. Obviously, this is not a server yet, but we can do something like a server and then plug this into Apache server and run it on port 1234. And then we say start. So this is Apache server, which is implemented in Java. So now if we run this, we can see like this process doesn't terminate because the server is running in the background. And we can do something like, for example, curl. And can we, we can go to localhost, one, two, three, four. And if we do uh, get, so we send in get from curl, user agent curl, right? And we're getting back a response with hello world. So that's basically how you can do hello world, literally like in two, three lines in HTTP for K. So what's going on here is that this is obviously just a Lambda. Then on this line, we're wrapping this Lambda. So HTTP4K can plug this into Apache server, which is a Java component, which is an actual server. You can also use Jesse or Undertow and so on. And then we start it. So that's what's going on basically here. And so that, that's fine, but we were like running the whole thing from curl. So maybe we can do better and like write a client here as well. So what we can do, we can write a similar thing in HTTP4K. So to do this, we can we define HTTP client, which has the same type of HTTP handler. And then we can say HTTP client. Um, so what we want is do get request, right? And to do get request, we want to specify basically the same thing localhost one, two, three, four. So that's the port that we had and we get back a response. And then we print the response. So I can specify type exactly. And so if I run this now, it will stop the previous process. And you can see now we get the output again. So it's the same we've seen on the command line. So, but this time it's printed on line 14. So the interesting thing here, what's going on is that like one of the most important concepts for server as a function is that both server and client, they kind of have the same type HTTP handler and HTTP handler takes like the same request in both cases for client and server and they return the same response in both cases. So they're um, unified. It's not symmetric, it's actually unified. So that, that's basically the same 
thing. So what I mentioned in, in Finagle, it's like it's done slightly different. So in Finagle, let's say if we, I, I just type what you can read in the paper here and say, Finagle, these are not ATP handlers, it's more generic, it's like a service. It takes a request, which is a type argument to, and get a reply. And this basically also a function which takes a request and returns the future of reply. Uh, they talking about their own futures, but I'll just use Java future. So the difference here is that HTTP simplifies things says like there is no generic request response, it's just HTTP. That simplifies lots of things and makes it more focused. And then there is no future in response type as we've seen in HTTP handler is just a response. So it makes all the code more like simpler. It's they are, are less synchronous, but like most of the time you genuinely don't need that. So that's like simplifies lots of things. So that's uh, in terms of difference compared to Finagle and um, yeah. So what we have here is basically flow world, but it's a bit toy example because if I do like foo here, it still works. Basically because our handler responds to any re to request on any path. What we ideally want here is to have 404. So we like what you can do in HTTPK, you can use a function called roots. And this function, we can, in this function, we can define, let's say for hello, we can bind get request to the same uh, lambda we had. This is just a small DSL. These are all just functions. So there is no kind of magic going on. So if I run this now, it should show 404. And yeah, so it does show 404. And obviously if I do hello, it will start working now because we're binding get to this path to get request. And well, the next thing is that we're not really using request here. So maybe we want to use something like name and say name when we request hello. So we can say name, say equals Bob. And here we can use name as a local variable. And we can get queries from the request by like using this kind of API query. There are different ways, but let's just do the simplest thing and get query out. So now we get hello Bob over there. So that's kind of cool, but there is a small problem is that this is a, an nullable string. So if we forget to specify name, it will be just null. So one way, like a Kotlin way would be just to throw an error and say name is required. Right, so now if we forget the name, it's going to be an exception and we'll just see what happens. And now it's like just blows up with uh, an exception. What's interesting here, so we get 500 and everything. What's interesting is that we don't really do anything in the code to catch this exception. We just have these two lines and that's all we do. So what's actually going on is that Apache server, uh, it's the Java like Java code and Apache server, it catches all exceptions and does this for us. So it's not our code doing that. It's not HTTP even. So there is a, like, it would be nice to do it ourselves, like to, in, instead of exposing, let's say, stack traces to clients. So, and for server as a function, there is another core concept, which is called filters. So we can do this with filters. So we can define a filter, something like that. So let's say filter and filter is, um, I can go to source code. So handler request response and filter is just handler function, which takes a handler and returns a handler. So basically we have a handler here and the simplest filter we can write is just a filter which returns a handler. Obviously that's useless. So we can do now wrapper handler and it will take some request. And we can call the original handler with that request and then just return a wrapper handler. So this is like a bit more convoluted, but still just calls the original handler and does nothing, except that we can do more interesting stuff. For example, we do try catch, right? And in try catch, we can return response and some other status like I'm a teapot. So now we have this filter and all we need to just plug it in into our uh, handler. So we say this is a filter. So if I run this now, we expect I'm a teapot. And so we get this uh, response. So there are built-in filters in HTTPK. It's like you don't have to write all of them yourself. So there is one which can be useful for debugging print and print request and response. So it basically will log all HTTP traffic. And we can also chain filters, which is in what is interesting. So actually this filter should be called catch all. 
So um, chain in fields is basically just function composition. So we can define this as filters variable. And if we look at the type, it's just singular filter. It's not a list. So it's just functions wrapping functions. And if we can even look at the van, van function, it's again, it's just calling the next filter after this filter, basically. So without going into detail, so we can plug in filters now. And also to be fair, this catch all is kind of fun, but there is also built in. And I think it's quite easy to re-implement. So all the projects where I worked, just we would have our own catch all variation. So if I run this again now, so we can see now all the requests, get request and response, they're logged by this filter, print request and response. And then we get stack trace from catch all. So yeah, so that's that's how, what you can do with filters. So similar, just to compare again to finagle, so in finagle filter would also take request and reply as a type arguments. Then it's a bit more convoluted function because it takes, I think, just this, ah, didn't work. So it takes request and it takes the whole service and returns a future of reply. So I think what's the what's the, the idea is basically that filter takes a request, probably does something to request, then passes the request to service. And once service replied, it does potentially something to reply. And this is all asynchronous. So again, compared to HTTPK, HTTPK is like much simpler, where filter is just a wrapper around HTTP handler. So again, like another simplification. So yeah, so that's basically advanced hello world for HTTPK. Um, for an actual nuts and crosses or tic-tac-toe, don't really need client, right? So I'll delete that. And we don't need all these finagle things. So I'll just simplify that. And what we can do again, we can maybe plug in filters into there. And the whole roots will become an actual function now. So I'll just call it new backend. So this will be our backend service. So I can now inline maybe things like that. Um, so this is our new backend with filters. Then we wrap it as an Apache, plug it into Apache server and start it. And this is our backend. So to kind of show the advantage of having service function, like one of the big advantages is testability. So what we can do, we can write some tests for the backend. So we can set class class backend tests. It's also an interesting thing like plural tests because usually you have multiple tests in a class file. So the normal convention of test is wrong. Everyone else is wrong. This is the right convention. And like we can start to do it by get game state. So something like that. So because our server is a function, we can easily create it with just as a variable. We obviously have an option to plug it into server, start it as a server and talk to it over HTTP, but we can also just run it in memory. So, and what we can do here, we can say game uh, get, and let's say slash game will be a thing. So then we expect um, this um, state uh, response to be okay. We expect okay. We can create an extension function on the response and we can say that status should equal okay status. And then we can return this as a response. So if I run this now, then we expect this to fail because we don't even have endpoint registered. So that's what happens. So you can see uh, expected 200, but what's 404. So obviously we need to implement that. So we can do game here, then probably you don't need request now. And we can say some game state just to hard code something, right? So now the test should pass. Then we can extract response into a variable and we can say that response body string should equal some JSON because we expect JSON back and this line should fail now. So it does with game state. And here we basically on the search side, we need some domain kind of logic. So for the simplicity, uh, let's represent it as a game data class, which will contain moves. It will be a list of moves, uh, initially an empty list. And move will also be 
data class with x and y variables. So it will be I guess in y coordinate, and then there will be a player who made the move, where player is going to be an enum of x and y. So what we want is basically we'll have game somewhere here, and then we do let's say just do to stream to see that it, it's kind of fine. So yeah, we get some we get something back, but that's not JSON. So in like the standard thing and I've seen would be to maybe convert it to JSON somehow using Jackson. And that's the thing you can do it, but there is a bit more kind of standard. H2K thing is to use lens. Lens is a functional concept, which is basically glorified getters and setters. You can think about it this way. So the way we can define it is using this, um, this syntax, basically body auto and then say to lens. So there is, we need some import here from Jackson. So what's going on here is that we import this fun extension function from module, H2K module Jackson. So H2K will automatically convert game objects to and from JSON using Jackson. And the way you can use lenses, so this is bidirectional lens, so it can do, um, it can insert objects into responses and extract them. So for inserting in mean it's called inject. So we can say we inject game and then we can say into target, which will be okay response. And we get back a response. So this whole thing is response. So if we run this, we should get some JSON back. So now we can see it's like some JSON, we can paste it back into the code. Yeah. And the test should pass now. So yeah, so that's like the basic of mm, getting the game state and serialization. So what we're doing, we're using game lens to convert game. So that's like, we're just getting game. So maybe the next thing to do would be to make some moves by players. We can say players make turns on each move. And what we want is something similar to that, I suppose. We want to maybe do posts instead. And it will be just like, I, ideally it should be payload, but just for simplicity, let's do something like that. Passes as a, as a query. So X and Y are gonna be zero, one, and two, zero. Like we basically make two moves and then we query the state of the game again. So it will be some JSON, but with non-empty moves, right? So let's run this again. So we expect this to fail again because post is not bound to anything. So yes, yeah, so this fails. <coughs> and we can create another endpoint and bind it to post this time. So we want to return so also some kind of okay thing suppose, but what's, so yeah, if we pass, if we run this code, we should just move on to the next failure. So yeah, so it does like the next line that fails is this one. It shows empty moves, that's, that's wrong. And overall, what we want here is basically we need a request and we want to extract X and Y from it. So we could do something like we did before, like query X, then uh, do uh, question mark dot to int and so on, and but we can also use lenses so just to show that lenses can be used for different things, including queries, so the slightly different syntax. And then we can do this like required X and we can have the same for Y. So if we have, we can use X lens and this time we don't inject, we extract from request. So if we request this uh, extract, we get back X and it will have type of int no question mark. So lens will extract it or throw um, an exception if it didn't succeed. And the same thing we can do with Y. So that's how we can get X and Y. So the next thing to do would be maybe to kind of update the game. So at this point it should be the same game as this object, right? So should probably have game as a kind of global variable at this point, the whole routing handler becomes somewhat like an object. And what we want is probably game and game should make move to X and Y. And then the game will automatically switch between X and Y. 
So I need to change this to var and um, just define this make move function as a as a member. So git game is immutable. So basically, make move create, uh, returns a new instance of the game. And like if we run this, it will fail on to do. And if we just go back to test for a second, so at this point, um, it feels like we're testing our business logic through backend, which is not the ideal. So if it was a real code, I would go and say like probably it's time to actually write tests for the game itself and maybe like do this test at the domain level kind of thing. But because it's like just to save time and because this is not the main point of this talk, it's just like, let's keep it and I'll just type the code. So yeah, I'll pretend there were tests here. So just to make a move what we want, we basically want to return a new game with new moves. So it will be the old moves plus a new move X and Y and it will have the next player where the next player will be, uh, we can say if moves last or no um, player, if it's not X. So if the last player was null or it was uh, not, then we return X. Otherwise we go for player oh, oh, and I'll do inputs. So that's like the logic of like adding a move. Then we probably want to end the game. And for this, we can have a winner, which is a player. And on construction, we can just try and find who, if anyone won the game. So if there are no winners, it's null. Otherwise, it's the player. And what we can do here, we can do player and go through all values. And we will try and find the player who has won. And to do that, we can kind of iterate from, let's say, 0 to 1. And for each of those, we'll generate moves. So we'll try generate all moves in the top row. For this, we'll have it as an X and we'll fix Y at zero and it will be the current player. And if this move is in moves and all moves from zero to two are in moves, so that's like the top row. So we can do the same thing for the all rows. And then we can also do like swap X and Y and generate more code. That's diagonal. And that's the opposite diagonal to minus A. So that's like not that maybe the best and more succinct way, but this should work. And then like the last thing to add to here, if there is a winner and it's not null, uh, and it's not equal to null, then we can just return the game. So like the, there are no moves in this case. So that's the idea. Um, yeah, so that, that's like the whole domain that we need. So now if we run this, even the first game state now fails because we added winner and serialization. So the, we could copy paste this, but the second one, it becomes quite long. So if we look at the test, this is going to be quite long, JSON to copy paste. So. So yeah, we could just copy paste it basically, but there is maybe like a better or alternative option at least. So what we can do, we can just use the game lens here. And instead of asserting on JSON, we can say extract game from response. And then we can assert on the game itself. So it should be like the game with moves of list of, and then we can say it's gonna be move of zero, one player X and the other player at two zero. So that should pass the one of the tests, right? And we can do the same thing here. So this way it becomes um, kind of a bit more convenient to not assert on JSON, even though you might choose to assert on JSON as well. So you can notice also here shorthand for invoke, which is the same as extract. So yeah. So that's basically all the backend things for the game. And yeah, that's where backend is. So now I guess it would make sense to do a bit more front-end things. And in real world, you don't need to do front-end in HTTPK, it could be anything else, it could be TypeScript. It's more, probably more standard thing, but because you can, and just to show this. So we'll probably have something like that, new front-end, HTTP handler, and it should be, again, just some kind of roots. 
I'll just prototype it quickly. So it will be root, it will return response okay with uh, somebody as like some HTML. Right, so that's what we want. And similar to this, it will be just new front end, maybe a server, and not just on a different port. And in real world, you would we would have like two separate files running, right? So front end wouldn't be in the same main function. And obviously, front end needs to will need to talk to back end because they're all in memory. We could just pass a reference to an object because they're all in memory. But let's just do pretend this these are separate processes and write a back end client as if it was uh, a back end client. That's right. So to do this, we can again do HTTP, okay, HTTP at this parameter. Oh, that's, that's fancy. Um, I could call backend. So the thing though will be that if we use backend inside frontend, we need to know the actual URL and port number, and we don't want to hard code that. So what we can do, we can wrap this uh, HTTP handler, which is a client with the filter. So there is a built-in filter set base URI from. So this is not specific sim like this. There is not this is not some special code. It's just a normal filter which wraps this HTTP handler and sets base URI from like whatever we specify here. And here it should be HTTP local host one two three four just the the code from above. So that should be sufficient. That's how we can plug in backend client into front end. And well, yeah, it's not like doing anything now. So maybe we should write some tests for front end. So let's write some tests. It will be class front end tests. And we can do something similar to this again. So get game state. We can do a new front end which this time won't, well, we'll just talk to backend directly because it's all the same type signature. We can just plug it directly into here and we can say this is a front end. It's all in memory. And then for front end, we again can do a get request and get a slash and we expect, okay. So let's, let's see if that works. I think it shouldn't, oh, didn't run all tests. Yeah, now it actually worked. So yeah. Um, then we want to get back a response. And this time for response, we can try something slightly different. So the, we, I'll use this annotation from Jupyter, which adds additional functionality to the test. Remote. So it's basically, we can say, we use approval tests, which is also part of HTTP4K and lets you do approval tests on responses. So well, with this um, extension, what it does, it lets you add parameters to your tests. And this time we can get approver. And then we can assert that this response is in the shape that we approved. So it's like, it's also known as snapshot assertions or golden master and so on. So I'll, I'll explain in a second if you're not familiar. So now like this test is failing saying there is no approved content. What that means really is that now we, the, when, fa when failing this test created this file, which is based on the class name plus the function name, and it has an extension dot actual, and it just captured whatever we returned from the front end. If you remember from the front end, we returned some HTML and it just saved it in that file. And what, what it says, it doesn't know if there is any approved content and it knows that content was approved by looking at the file called like test name plus function name plus approved. So if we rename this file to approved, it will look in this file, compare it to what we get as a body of the response and should be happy now. So that's just a way to kind of lock down the behavior of the code. So yeah, that, that's now what front end does. But obviously that's not what we want. We don't want some, some HTML, we want something a bit more real. For that, uh, HTTP4K has support for different template engines. For example, it has like uh, handlebars templates and let's use hot reload and path will be SRC test. It's like, if you notice it's all kind of in test just for me to save time. And it's all in one file. Like in reality, I don't do that. 
and then this will be an HTML renderer. So then now we can do use HTML renderer and we can render the same. We'll have a game view class created here. Game view, and it has to be view model, which is a tagging interface from HTFK. So let's run this now, see what happens. It's now failing saying that it didn't find game view. What it means, it just wants a file called game view and HBS as a standard handlebars uh, extension. So that's like not related to HTTPK. And then we can paste in somebody here, which is just some HTML. We can say hello, V, and yes, German flag. So, uh, so yeah, if we run this now, it should fail again because like uh, you can diff it from IntelliJ. It's like expected some HTML, but we now changed the content. So yeah, we just like, this looks like what we wanted. So I can copy this command, which basically just overrides the file. So now it overrides, if we run this, it's all happy. And maybe like for the first time, we actually have something to look at. So maybe we should just actually do that. So I ran the whole thing, actually might be a good idea to print something because that's, you can say println started, uh, started on HTTP localhost 880. So if I run this now, it's like at least a little bit more friendly. Yay, started. So maybe I'll switch to this. So yay, it looks like, looks like it works. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's like minimal front end. Uh, what we really want something maybe more substantial here because we like this game view is based on nothing, it's empty. <laughs> So we actually want to call backend. And what we want from backend is to get the game. So basically we're calling this line 54 and getting the game over here, the game. And that will give us a response. And again, we can use lens to just extract the game. And that's a really convenient that we like use this lens and tests, we use it here. So um, yeah, that's kind of nice. And then we probably want to convert game to view. So need uh, an extension function, which converts game to this view. And for view, I'll just type, uh, well, we want game view, that's for sure. And we probably need more things in the view, which will make sense maybe if I paste more things into here. So I'll have something kind of prepared to save time. So basically want like, two nested iterations over rows and then inside each row we show a player or we can show a url to make a move on the front end and at the end we can say show if there is a winner right so we want something similar in the view so we can have let's say rows uh, it will be val rows of type list and it will be cell view here and we might have a winner type string question mark then cell view will be, um, yeah, we'll also need X and Y, I think, for the URL. And there will be a player potentially, string question mark. So that's the idea for the, that's what we need for the template. And to do that, uh, what we need is maybe here we can iterate over X and Y. So we have X and Y, and then we generate a cell view with X and Y and player, and probably a player if there was a move at this point. So we can say moves find, um, we can find a move at the same X as the current X and at the same Y. It's not the most efficient code, but it should do. So then we get a player and then we probably get a name. So it's all knowable. And the winner should be even simpler. It's just a winner name. Um, something is not happy here. Oh yeah, double equals. So yeah, that's a, that's a bit complicated. I'll show it again on the screen so it makes sense. So what we have here, basically inside the templates, we iterate over rows. So the context of this whole template is the game view object. So probably should also suppress it because IntelliJ suppress all the warnings. IntelliJ doesn't know we use it there. So we iterate over rows. Then we have nested iteration. And then inside we have cell view as the context object. Um, 
and then we check if player made a move, then we show player. Otherwise, we show this URL. So yeah, let's just run this and see what happens. So, well, we can actually look in the browser as well. So the yeah, URL sells now. They don't do anything. We can kind of cannot see what's going on after the click, but that's that's fine. So it uh, looks okay. And then we will have to reapprove the test now again. So because we replace this text with that. This is maybe like one of the things which can be slightly annoying with approval tests and there are tools to make it a bit easier to like approve all files and then just confirm them in version control instead of doing it manually. So like re review all the changes in bulk. So yeah, so that's like how you can do front ends and there is like one final feature for front end really is to be able to make moves. So like that's, I promise that's the last feature. So what we want is something like that, basically very similar test to backend. So we want front end here. We want, I'll do get because that's what we have in the template. That's really for simplicity. And then we can say move and here maybe just for fun, I'll use it as a path to, to, have to just have something different. So the idea here is very similar. So we do two moves in the front end it will talk to backend and like all the way back. And then we request this page with the game again, and we need an approval here. So yeah, so if we run this, it will now fail because we never specified move endpoint for front end. So this is failing. That's good. And well, let's do that quickly. I guess we want something similar. That's front end and it will have move. And to extract those X and Ys, uh, HTTPK supports this kind of syntax. So that was get. And then we get a request here. And we want um, leave with, yeah, I'll just leave it out. So what we want is a request. And we can extract path for parts of path using like this kind of function. So right now here, we don't really care if it's integer or string, we can just pass it on basically. There are other ways to make it in a type safe way, but here and just to do it in a simple way, we can do that. And then we can post to backend, backend slash game. We can post X equals dollar uh, X. And, oh, that should be question mark. Um, not that one. So game question mark x equals x and y equals dollar y. So we basically we're passing through parameters. In reality, we should also check what backend says, and then like there is a question of how to handle this error. And then at the end, we want probably just to render what we get here. So we, if we if this was extracted as a function, we could just call it, or we can do more like an HTTP thing and say see other status and specify a header saying that's the location. And basically browser will re-request this itself. So that's like the, the whole thing, how to handle moves on the front end. So now it will fail with this expects 200 in the test, but it was a redirect. And the problem here is this front end is a HTTP handler, which doesn't follow redirects. And what we can do was thing follow redirects, which is another filter. So we can wrap our front-end, back-end with this filter. And then it should just follow redirects and we shouldn't get, um, so we, we should move on basically and fail on the next failure, not on expect okay. So yeah, now I think it fails. Yeah, it fails on approvals and we can just approve it probably. Yeah, I'll just approve it. And we can actually look in the UI what it's, what it's like. So yeah, I think all the tests passing now. Yeah, good. And I'll just run main again. So we run it. So if we refresh this now, we should be able to do so. Go X, then O, then X. Then X will gonna win. So yeah, that, that works. If we click again, remember there was this logic for the winner, so nothing happened. I, like, yeah, this is definitely a toy example. So to, re to start a new game, you need to rerun your server. So that, that's not ideal like this for the next iteration. So just to see that the game works, let's make maybe not swing. So I go X. 
So yeah, that also looks fine. Maybe it's worth doing um, a draw if I can figure out how to do a draw. Um, not sure, I need to make bad moves basically. I hope I'll succeed. Yes, so we don't, we don't handle draw properly. So maybe that's like another thing to do. So yeah, that's pretty much like the whole thing. And just to maybe look again at the code quickly, what we had, we had like a main function which starts back end, start front end, should be in separate files. Then we had front end here, all this code, we're like creating front end with those two endpoints, which using handlebars. Then we had back end here with two roots. Right, so should also go into separate file. Then lenses, that was kind of serialization, deserialization. It's like used in both front end and back end, maybe should go somewhere in some other place. And then there was this business logic with the game and moves. Um, so yeah, that's like breakdown of the main of the main code. This is actually like IntelliJ is wrong. It doesn't know what it's complaining about. It's happy now. Um, yeah, and look at the so we had front end tests. Uh, for the game, I mean, so it's very similar backend tests. And that's like the, another idea is that you could write tests in a more abstract way and then run them at different layers of your system. You could run it against backend. You can run it from the front end side, but you would have like the same abstraction on top. And then like, ideally, yeah, we should have written some tests. So yeah, that's like the whole coding demo. And this is really just kind of hello world for HTTPK, so there are more things in HTTPK. There are many modules. So I was mostly showing core module, uh, a couple other modes, but mostly core. So there are more built-in filters. There is integration with more HTTP clients. There are more, there is more, there are more integrations with HTTP servers. Uh, there are more integrations with JSON XML libraries, serialization, deserialization, and more template engines. Those are just like basics. There are also HTTPK was written by people who like early adopters of uh, TDD and all these practices. So it has lots of things about tests. There's like you've seen approval tests. You can also do a contract tests by writing down the behavior of some remote server and running the same set of tests against the remote server and your fakes. So you can define your fakes best based on recording and replay because, because of the HTTP handler being the same, whether it's remote or recorded and so on. And you can also do chaos testing when you just had some, some chaotic behavior. Uh, so as a summary, if you remember one thing from this, please make sure it's this thing that client and server should have the same signature. Not many libraries are doing this. So if you write a new library in any language, please use this because it simplifies lots of things like testing and so on. And as a like summary, what we've seen, like the core of HTTP is like there is a handler, which is a function, stateless or stateful doesn't matter. And then it takes an immutable request and returns an immutable response. And there is a filter which wraps around it. Basically, that's like the whole idea is quite simple. So in terms of overall design, I think HTTPK is pretty good. It's like the, the main lesson is that to keep it simple compared to other like frameworks and libraries, it's like much simpler than, yeah, it's quite simple. Then like the whole idea about testing everything, what we've seen like testing at backend, frontend level and so on. And basically libraries are better than frameworks in different ways. But they just the main thing is that they're less magic. And at the end of the day, you can step in through the code. Right. So what you can do next is this was an intro. You can see maybe a bit more advanced or more abstract content by the authors of HTTPK. So if you type HTTPK Kotlin Conf, you can see video by Ivan and David. Then there is a newer talk. If you type test driven apps with HTTPK into YouTube, you'll find this. Right. And obviously the website is HTTPK, there has like the documentation and quick start and so on. And source code, obviously. And don't forget about Kotlin Lang Slack. There is a channel HTTPK. It's very friendly. And yeah, you you will if you have a problem, like the authors most likely will respond to you within hours. So yeah, it's, it's still kind of good time. It's like Kotlin used to be itself. Um, yeah, so you, you can find everything I mentioned, like source code and all the links are on in this repo right now. So don't, don't need to remember anything. So this is it. Thank you for watching. You can find me on Twitter, GitHub, some videos on YouTube.
So yeah, I'm happy to like talk or look at the questions now. Awesome. And we do have one already, which is from Koppel Schof. Um, and he asks, or he says he has a rather specific question. It is, how would you set a secure cookie via WebSocket, which is not accessed by the client code? Well, yeah, um, I've never done that. So I, I can just genuinely say maybe I would, like if it was question, I would, I would just ask it on Slack. So. <laughs> I've never done it, so I don't know that the answer is like really. No. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so let's let's uh, find this out, and you can discuss this later with Dimitri uh, Kopachev. So just join us on the Kotlin Lang Slack and ping Dimitri. Uh, there's another question uh, from Pajanilingum. Sorry, um, he asks if HTTP 4K is coroutine friendly. Yeah, yeah, I can also read it. I, I, well, the 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 re it's it's not it doesn't support coroutines. It integrates with Kato, but it doesn't support coroutines because it will. My understanding is that it will change type signature of everything everywhere, and there is in general question of how many people really really need this rather than how many people being convinced that they need coroutines in the code, and there is Project Loom on Java if it like gives the same performance benefits, then you could leverage that without changing your design. So I think that overall it's the, the this type of problem because I, yeah, so it, it doesn't basically, it doesn't have coroutines. All right, fair enough. So let's say uh, lots and lots of thank yous for you. So Chris just said awesome talk, thank you. You're welcome. Chris, and I can just, just second this, it was a really, really great live coding session. So any other questions, folks? You have a couple of seconds left. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Now, Dimitri, thank you so much. Uh, it was really, really great, great session. And uh, let's stay in touch. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Perfect, have a good one. And to the rest of you, we will see us hopefully last Thursday next month. See you then. See you. Bye.